Uh, welcome to London on a, a lovely sunny day, which it isn't, but at least it isn't raining. Welcome to London on a day where you're not being surrounded by police, as what happened uh, to me yesterday in central London, where um, um, I've never seen so many policemen in my life um, uh, associated with the uh, forthcoming G8 conference. And welcome to two days of time. And I think time we really need um, uh, to connect, to support each other, and to learn, because we are at the start of a journey here. Well, the journey has started now. Um, um, and I think it's time we think around exactly how we're going to manage um, uh, the rest of this year and the next. So we're in, we're in an interesting place. And um, we've heard many times that um, interesting places are places to be in, but they're also really quite challenging. And I think we're in a particularly challenging position at the moment. Um, and it's a strange way, perhaps, to open a conference around the fact that we're in a difficult place. But I think it's only fair to you, to me, and to our populations that one is honest about how difficult the place is we're in at the moment. Um, we're working within a system that is largely broken, or close to broken. Um, we're working within a system where there is talk of a new law called the duty of candor to really force us to tell the truth to our populations, which really means, potentially, that over the last 70 odd years, perhaps we haven't been telling the truth to our populations, which I refute, I might add. But we clearly have some issues around connecting with our populations. And I think that is a real challenge we have in front of us. And it's a significant challenge. Midstaffs is really quite an important and profound event which changes the nature of healthcare and its delivery completely. So that's one dimension, and if that's not enough, we have the issue of currencies. We have a, we have a system where the currencies are partly related to activity, as in secondary care, partly population-based. Good morning, Norman. Um, partly population-based in primary care, and in many respects, that's actually quite difficult. It's very difficult to have a system where one part of the system is pulling in one way and another part is pulling in another, and we need to move to whole person value-based currencies and systems and tariffs as quickly as possible, and that, that is a real challenge I think we have in front of us. But that's more of a challenge, not necessarily a bad place uh, to be in. And <clears throat> we're in a system where general practice has come under some significant criticism occasionally, sometimes perhaps warranted, many times I would suggest completely unwarranted. Um, um, and I think we have to, we have to try to regain uh, some ground in terms of, again, connecting to our population. So what we have in front of us is a really quite difficult mix. And if we add to this the difficulties associated with what could be a really quite difficult financial settlement later on this year, where there is going to be added financial pressure, we're in some difficulty. I mean, hospitals also are in transition. We know they're in transition. We know there are going to be plenty of reconfigurations. And what a time for a new organization to be born in the midst of all this. And my God, if we wanted the challenge, well, we certainly have found one. But um, I think it's important to appreciate that this is not of our making. Um, uh, this is what we inherited, and now it's really up to us to find a way to actually manage the transition from where we were to where we need to be. And I think we're already seeing some green shoots as to how we can actually manage that transition, because the, the challenge of reconnecting with the population is a significant one. But there are CCGs that are already working with the local authorities trying to deliver that. There are people who are starting to understand the nature of prevention and really taking it to heart and moving the services forward in that direction. We also have real opportunities around integrated care, and Norman will highlight that in his intervention in a few minutes. Um, um, and integrated care really is the future, but integrated care must mean something and must have context. 
and that context means it has to be bound by something. It can't work within a system where one part of the system is governed by some metrics and another by another. So there's a whole piece of work associated with that. And also, we need to remember that our future is in engaging primary care because we are of primary care and we are primary care. And I think there are some lessons to learn in terms of what happens to PCTs in some cases and to make sure we don't end up in the same situation. So I think we're on the right sort of path. Um, I certainly would have chosen a slightly different terrain to start with, but then, hey, who can choose? Um, um, I think we've had a confluence of difficulties which have all come together. And it's really now the challenge for us to start to try to find a way through that. And of course, we've got to do that in a world of transparency, which in many respects, I think, is to our advantage, because it is the only way we're going to manage this system. So have a good conference. Have a really good, take the opportunities there are to interconnect, to speak to people, to speak to peers, to learn from other people to grab me or anybody else you wish to and have a, have a private conversation. This is a real opportunity and conferences are really good for that. Um, and also take the time to reflect. This is really quite unusual for you to be able to come out of the cauldron where you're working at the moment to have a little bit of time to think. It is a very valuable time um, and I think it needs to be taken and used very, very, very carefully. So let me introduce the first speaker. Um, I met Norman Lamb quite a few years ago, um, um, before, the, before the last election, when we're talking about health systems and health redesign, and in some respects, we're back to the same place. Um, and I think this is a real opportunity we have here to reconnect with all parts of the system uh, through um, some of the new initiatives that are being uh, talked about at the moment. So, I'd like to thank guys, Norman, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Charles, uh, and it's uh, very good to be here. Extraordinary place it is. Uh, and it was uh, an interesting journey on the DLR, crushed in like sardines uh, from Canning Town, I think it was, but it's good to have got here. Uh, and uh, I wanted to say something, first of all, to set the scene about the uh, scale of the challenge that we face. Uh, so across the Western world, uh, we have a situation where health costs are rising at about 4% uh, a year, uh, particularly driven by an ageing population, but a whole load of other factors, lifestyle conditions, cost of interventions, and so forth. And yet, um, a current position with public finances across very many countries where there's no realistic prospect of substantial extra investment in health systems and it's not just a situation in this country it's across the whole of the western world uh, and uh, on top of that uh, we have a situation where <clears throat> i think many people feel that uh, we don't always serve the interests of some of those people particularly those with chronic conditions as well as we could do <clears throat> so We've, over this last uh, four-year period, been seeking to meet what was known as the Nicholson Challenge, a, uh, a, an efficiency saving, as it's called, of about £20 billion. Uh, when we get to the next parliament, we have the potential for having to achieve a further set of efficiency savings. Now, this is an extraordinary challenge, and it's, to be blunt, it's not just government as we all know, uh, that can sort this problem. We all actually have a stake in getting the system working optimally, achieving a system that is sustainable and that delivers what we want for the people who need our care and support. Uh, and for someone who has always cared passionately about the NHS, who believes in the principle of the NHS, I believe that this is an urgent and substantial task to try to ensure that we achieve a system that is sustainable and that delivers care for those who need it. And I think of four, in a way, fundamental shifts that I think need to take place to start to try to meet those challenges. First of all, a shift, in a way, from repair to prevention. We've, over the last decade or more, uh, we've invested quite heavily in the 
NHS, but we've invested primarily at the repair end of the spectrum rather than at the prevention end of the spectrum. And it's been driven in a way by an imperative to reduce waiting times in hospitals, payment by results, which has driven money into acute hospitals, but not perhaps a sufficient focus on preventing ill health and preventing a deterioration of health. So that's, in my view, one of the big shifts that needs to take place. Secondly, I believe fundamentally we need to move from a fragmented system to a much more integrated system, and I will come back to that as well. Thirdly, I think we have to shift from rather a sort of an exclusive system where statutory services believe that or see traditionally that it is their job to care for patients and then to send them back home again to a much more inclusive system where there's a much greater engagement between statutory services uh, and community and people. People, the power of people to help us sustain the system and to provide better care and support for people I think becomes an absolute uh, imperative. And then finally, shifting from what is ultimately rather a paternalistic system to a personal approach where the patient, the individual, the user of the service is absolutely centre stage and where their interests and their priorities are most important. Now I also start from the premise that we have a remarkable workforce uh, in the NHS and in care services. By and large, people choosing a career in caring and wanting to do the very best they can for their patients or their, uh, or their users of services. And yet sometimes I think people in the service feel frustrated because uh, they are having to follow diktats from on high and not really empowered to make a difference to the service that they know better than anyone else. And I think if we can exploit, in the best possible sense of the word, this extraordinary workforce... Uh, then I think that is very much part of the solution, not part of the problem. So let me start by dealing with the Care Bill, uh, which has just started its passage through Parliament. It represents the most significant reform of care and support legislation for over 60 years. Through the Care Bill, uh, we're clarifying <coughs> entitlements to care and support to give people a better understanding of what is available to help them plan for the future and to ensure that they know where to go for help when they need it. The bill will make a reality uh, of our vision for a system which promotes people's well-being and focuses on the person, not the system or the service. I had a very interesting example. I <coughs> visited a couple in uh, my constituency of North Norfolk in the little village of Trunch. This is a couple uh, getting on in years. The husband uh, was finding winters very difficult. He was becoming very depressed. He was slumped on the sofa, doing very little. And to be blunt, his wife was finding him pretty difficult company. They were unhappy. They were having a bad life. They were isolated. Even though there were two of them, they were isolated from their community. And then one day, the wife saw an advert in the local paper for a Red Cross outreach service organised by the county council. And a guy came round from Red Cross. And his question was not, what sort of care and support do you need? His question was, what makes your life happy? What, do, what gets you going? And they discovered that he'd been in the forces and that he'd... He had some pride in his period that he, he'd been in the forces. And he was asked by the Red Cross guy, have you engaged, have you joined the local British Legion? And he didn't even realise he was able to or that there was a local branch. He joined up. They both went to their Christmas lunch. They reconnected with people in their local community. And it's in a whole series of ways, through all sorts of other things that they got him doing, he got his life back. He got his mojo back again. And I think the question so often should be, what, what makes you happy, not what care and support can we deliver to you? And even what could you do for other people? So often people, when they face dependency, 
they feel useless. They feel that they no longer have a role or a purpose. And if you can give them that back, uh, all of their experience of life, uh, then I think you start to rebuild uh, the person. And the bill also makes preventing and reducing needs a priority. It empowers people to take control over their care and support. It introduces new national eligibility criteria, bringing greater consistency and transparency of access to care across the country. And it includes historic reforms to strengthen the rights of carers to access support, putting them on the same legal footing as those they care for. Now, we've also made a great deal of progress on funding with the publication and acceptance of the recommendations of the Dilnot Commission. This brings clarity and certainty to care and support costs, whether they relate to care and support you need because of old age or because of disability. Our reforms will enable people to plan and prepare for their care costs in a way similar to how they already save for their pensions. It protects people against catastrophic loss. There is nothing that anyone can do at present to protect against the catastrophic loss of care costs. Costs. Subject to legislation from April 2016, if you have eligible care needs, the most you will have to pay towards meeting those needs, you could of course choose to pay more if you want to, but the most you will have to pay will be capped at £72,000. And people in residential care with assets of under £118,000, including their home, will qualify for financial help, so their savings won't be wiped out by unlimited costs. At the moment, the threshold is 23,250. If you've got assets above that level, you're on your own. That is extended to 118,000. The result will be hundreds of thousands more older people having to pay less, either through the cap or extra support. And I believe that it will encourage the financial services industry and the pensions industry to provide products which will enable people to prepare for old age, to top up what the state will offer. It will be an incentive to save. Importantly, from April 2015, no one will have to sell their own home during their lifetime to pay for residential care by introducing provisions to give you a right to defer cost until the end of your life. And I believe this really is a significant advance for fairness, for common sense and common decency. People feel it is incredibly unfair that you can be prudent, work hard through your life, save for old age, and then see everything lost because of catastrophic care costs. Now, the other area that this government uh, and this ministerial team has singled out as a real priority, and it's something that I personally I'm very passionate about is integrated care. Now the great irony of much of the debate over the health reforms was that people feared and understandably that services would become fragmented. Now this of course implies that they weren't fragmented in the first place but as we know if we're honest that is not the case. Mental health has institutionally been separated from physical health. Does that make sense? from the patient's point of view if we're trying to provide care for the whole person. Primary care separated institutionally from secondary care. Health care from social care. Patients batted too often from pillar to post with little or no continuity. And it doesn't make sense from the patient's point of view. Uh, and it's uh, incredibly important that uh, uh, we address that uh, failure of the system, not of individuals. And I'm sure everyone in this room could point to things that don't work as they should, like our hospitals, too often full of patients, many with dementia, waiting an age for discharge because there is no real connection to primary, social and community care. Many of them should never have been in hospital in the first place, but once they are there, they can become trapped I had a conversation recently with a chief executive and chair of a hospital who had had two patients there with dementia for three months. There was no need for them to be in that hospital, and yet they had taken up beds at enormous cost to the system, but more important than anything else, it's poor care for those 
individuals. And it feels to me too often like a dysfunctional system designed for a past age and now with the massive challenge, the health challenge of the 21st century, the fact that so many people are living much longer, often with chronic conditions, often multiple conditions, and often a mix of mental and physical health, we have to ensure that the system is designed around their needs. Unless we get everyone working together, stop duplicating effort, start keeping people out of hospital, rather than dumping them in it as a default reaction to a crisis, then the NHS will eventually buckle under the pressure. We need to focus on prevention, on well-being, especially for those, as I say, with long-term chronic conditions. Now, we know that some parts of the country are showing how things can be done. In Leeds, they're changing the care and support market by encouraging corporate responsibility, engaging, collaborating with companies in the city, promoting volunteering, and flexible services. They give grants of up to £10,000 to support social enterprises all over the city, and they can make sure that those social enterprises can flourish by aligning them with private and third sector groups. And there is a collaboration between the local authority and voluntary groups. And the deal is this. The local authority says to the voluntary organisations, you help us keep people independent. You help people address... Uh, the real challenge of loneliness, of isolation, help give people a better life, delay the moment at which they become dependent and have to go into a care home or nursing home. And we, the local authority, achieve a saving. And we can share that saving with you. That's the deal. And it ends up with people getting better care and a better life. And that means that people in Leeds also now have access to a more diverse and well-rounded selection of services. In Northumbria, the local foundation trust has linked up the acute hospitals, community services and social care. In Cumbria, community services and GPs are working with local hospitals. And I'm quite sure that within this room there are very many of you working on changing the way things are done, using your skills, your understanding of the system to make the system work in a more rational way, but they are still the exceptions, not the rule. The paradox is that while everyone recognises the need for this kind of integrated care, for personalised treatment, it just doesn't yet happen everywhere. And even in those places that have made good progress, none to my knowledge have yet developed a fully integrated system of care. We have to move from a situation where really great people are doing brilliant things around our country in a way despite the system to a situation where far more people do brilliant things because they're encouraged to do so. That's the change of mindset that I want to see. Now, Chris Ham, the chief executive of the King's Fund, talks of integration as the challenge that will define modern healthcare in the same way that waiting times did a, a decade or so ago, and I agree with him. And what does this mean for people? Better integration means better care for the 15 million people with a long-term condition. It means addressing loneliness and isolation, reducing falls, identifying people at risk of relapse. It means discharging people more quickly and more safely, getting them more suitable care and support at home. It means squeezing every last penny of value from the money that we spend, using the money that we've got available to us much more effectively than we do now. At the moment, a disproportionately large slice of the NHS budget goes on older people and those with long-term chronic conditions, and understandably so. Those two groups are getting bigger, but they are also two groups who will really benefit from integrated care. That link is too important to overlook. Using integration to cut emergency readmissions, for example, could save £132 million a year in itself and improve care for people. Cut delayed discharges as well, and you're potentially saving hundreds of millions of pounds and improving care for people. And if whole place community budgets, which are being piloted around the country, happened everywhere, the savings could run into billions of pounds. That's serious money made available at a time when we desperately need it, using the money better and achieving better care for people. 
So to push forward far more quickly with integration, I recently announced how we are uh, asking local areas to come forward to be integration pioneers, providing living, breathing proof of what integrated care can do. The first group of successful applicants will be announced in September. We will then work closely with them to push the boundaries of integrated care. In those pioneer sites, commissioners and providers across health and social care will come together as one, unconstrained by the traditional fragmented ways of working. Good ideas could spring from anywhere, from commissioners, from providers, but wherever they come from, we will make sure that they spread quickly from group to group so that everyone is working off the same page. We will help each of the pioneer sites make sure that all the right people are involved to get things moving as quickly and as smoothly as possible. They will address issues of scale, harnessing patient power, prevention, improving public health, collaboration with other sectors, and crucially, bringing mental health into the mix. We will be permissive as a matter of principle. If pioneers want to try something new or work in a different way and it's rational, our starting place will be to say yes and to try to help rather than coming up with new ways to say no or getting in the way. There will be a central unit with experts in it to provide advice whenever it's needed. When I talk to people around the country trying to do great things, so often I'm told that they've gone to some local law firm and asked advice and the advice has been that you can't do it. Now we're reinventing the wheel hundreds of times, spending a fortune on lawyers, and I say this as an ex-lawyer, uh, and too often the, the, it's like computer says no. We want a unit that unlocks barriers, gets uh, problems out of the way, provides advice about how things can be done, not telling people that they can't do it. We'll link them to community budget sites who have already taught us so much about integration. Using the lessons from these pioneers, I want to make integrated care uh, the norm, and not just uh, in those sites, but everywhere. We're inviting expressions of interest from local organisations to become pioneers until the end of June. If you're interested, you can find out more and how you get involved by going to the gov.uk website. Now, I was in America recently, actually with Chris Ham, seeing what I could learn from across the Atlantic. Now, before you say it, I know the irony of looking at what has to be one of the most dysfunctional health systems in the world, spending double the amount of their GDP on health compared to what we do. Uh, uh, looking at that system for inspiration seems somehow counterintuitive. And actually going to the United States and talking to people involved in health and care makes you realise just how lucky we are to have our NHS. Yet, there are some real diamonds in the rough. Uh, Not-for-profit, integrated care organisations like Kaiser Permanente, based in California, Intermountain Health in Salt Lake City, and Group Health in Seattle. It's rather handy that they're in very nice places. Uh, organisations that have faced similar problems. Of course, everywhere is facing these problems. Uh, GPs facing burnout, we heard uh, from the organisation in Seattle. Real problem with GPs feeling that they're under enormous pressure. A&E departments under enormous pressure. Yet they had turned their situation around with genuine clinical leadership, integration across the piece, and critically the intelligent use of technology. I saw GP clinics where a third of the appointments were conducted via email, secure email, not forced, but there as an option for patients who didn't have time or didn't want to come in and where the GP felt that they were able to deal with the problem by email. And of course, by moving significantly in that direction, it freed up GP's time so that they were then able to spend more time with the patients who really needed their help. They told us about appointments lasting half an hour. Now, this seems extraordinary compared to the situation that we have in our country. A&E admissions from that clinic are down by 29% because they were identifying at-risk patients in advance more effectively, particularly using the technology and acting to prevent a crisis. The proper integration also of mental health, bringing mental health into primary care, 
demonstrating that they were reducing hospital admissions as a result. Much earlier intervention, preventing a deterioration of condition, better care for the individual, lower cost to the system. And the result of all of this work was savings to the system, GPs' well-being substantially improved and they'd measured it through time and patient satisfaction significantly improved as well. Now again, I know that there are also great examples of GP practices around this country redesigning services and it shows just what is possible. But this has to spread if we're to get the transformation that patients need and deserve and if we're to ensure that our system is sustainable. I want that forward-looking uh, think forward thinking commissioners and providers to come together, possibly as a pioneer site, to make this a reality. And I think we've got a real opportunity actually to sort of rebuild a shared vision of what we're trying to strive for, what we're trying to achieve better care within the constraints of the amount of money available. Uh, in the years ahead, we can all expect to need some degree of care and support as individuals. I hope that that need will be minimal, but we know that crossing our fingers and hoping for the best doesn't really cut it when it comes to sound policy making. Everything that we're doing, the care bill implementing the Dilnot recommendations, really pushing significantly for system-wide integration. I hope it shows our commitment to really getting to grips with and sorting out the mess that care and support can sometimes become. Now, we can enjoy sort of political knockabout about which government is to blame for what, but actually, if we're serious about it, if we really think about the challenges we face, the fact that these challenges confront every developed country, we realise that this is much more important than that. And it's up to all of us. Government can't do it alone. It's a collaboration to achieve the changes that are necessary. Now, you will understand that as a Liberal Democrat, I never imagined that I'd ever be a minister. This is not part of my mindset. I'm conditioned to being on the outside looking in. So I rather unexpectedly find myself in the position of being a government minister. And I'm just absolutely determined that I use my time in this role to the best possible advantage to achieve some of the things that I really care about. Not imposing things on people, but working collaboratively to achieve real and positive change. Everything that I want to do is resolutely focused on bringing about better care, better outcomes and all round better experiences for the person receiving care, for their carers and the family and achieving a sustainable system and ensuring that those working in the system have job satisfaction and feel a sense of mission and a sense of purpose and a, and a sense of confidence that the system is moving in the right direction. And if you have a contented, energised workforce, then of course you achieve better care. Now, all of you, from health and from social care, you have this government's full support in achieving this objective. And I very much look forward to seeing how we can work together to change the system for better in the years to come. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Norman. We have a, a few, can you say for a few questions? We have a few minutes for questions. Are there some roving mics around or? If anyone wishes to ask a question, could they just raise their hand so I'll know I can see them? I'll, I'll kick off then. I'll kick off with the... Oh, you can see better than I can. Richard, second row, Richard Bawtry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anne. Thank you, uh, uh, Minister, for what you said um, about integration. I think really important words. Uh, I just wondered whether you agree with Sir David Nicholson, who was quoted um, last week as questioning the commissioner-provider split, and could you envisage CCGs becoming providers as well as commissioners um, delivering that integrated model that you've been um, espousing? Well, I, I'm, I'm just really interested... Thanks, Richard, for, for that. I, I'm just really interested in having a, you know, a discussion about what's possible, and I think one of the potential great values of the pioneer sites 
is that we have the opportunity to experiment. And I, he talked, I, I, and in fact, I, I spoke to him yesterday about his comments last week. Uh, and he talked about the possibility of, in a sense, creating the best of Kaiser uh, in our country and bringing together commissioner and provider. And I think this is the sort of thing that we should absolutely be exploring and seeking to deliver. We have to, of course, uh, look at where there are barriers. Uh, if the barriers are irrational, whether they're legislative or cultural, we should seek to change them if it's possible to do so. Uh, but I want to get across the, the, the sort of mindset, and you know, I've been proselytising for this case for a long time, uh, and now I've got the opportunity to proselytise for it in places which matter more than uh, have done in the past. And, uh, and what I find is that people are listening and people are willing to you know, think the unthinkable and to change the way things are done if we can achieve a better approach. So I'm very much up for that discussion. Thank you. Lady in the first row. Roving mic? I'll be the roving mic. Pass the mic. Oh, it's gone. Okay, speak okay. here. What is it? Um, uh, the spoke a lot about uh, mics the arrived. mental health. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, Jill Hitchcock, health journalist. Um, you've spoken a lot about giving mental health parity with physical health. Um, I think that will require a great deal of investment, and I wondered at a time when the health service is under such <coughs> financial pressure whether that's achievable. Uh, well, uh, thanks for raising that. Um, mental health is something else that I feel pretty passionate about, and uh, I think what was interesting, first of all, uh, was the, the Schizophrenia Commission, which... Uh, goodness. The Schizophrenia Commission, which published its report... Um, before the end of last year um, made the point that money is often not spent uh, very effectively in mental health and that uh, an awful lot of the money is spent in inpatient care, uh, not necessarily uh, on a therapeutic basis for the interests of the patient and they called for a shift uh, in terms of trying to reduce uh, inpatient stays so that you can free up resource to invest in prevention uh, and uh, uh, early intervention. And there is so much about the way the system works that needs to improve. And I think, you know, bringing mental health back into the fold much more, ensuring that every A&E department has a proper collaboration with mental health. I still find it amazing that people can turn up in A&E with a significant mental health problem. I've had a constituent whose son turned up in A&E uh, having ligature marks on his neck. This is recent, in the last few years. He was turned away after a discussion of half an hour and took his own life the next day. And there was no one with mental health expertise to intervene in that case. And that is not an isolated incident. Uh, RAID are doing it in Birmingham, bringing a real collaboration together, and they are saving money. Uh, and in the States, I visited a fascinating collaboration uh, in New York State between a not-for-profit insurer uh, and a private provider. And the not-for-profit insurer was working with Medicaid patients. So this is people on the lowest possible income. And they were going out into hard-to-reach communities. Uh, and they were identifying the people who needed help most and getting them into the system. And they were finding that by much better use of data, we work in a fog in mental health in this country. We do not have the data that we need to make uh, rational judgments about where to deploy resources. By a much better use of data, by investing in quick interventions, getting access far quicker than we have in our country. This is under Medicaid. They were seeing a significant reduction in inpatient stays and much better mental health. Amazing returns, people getting back into work, sometimes with severe mental health problems, significant reductions in self-harm, reductions in suicide. All of the indicators were moving in the right direction. And they said to us, comparatively, looking around the world, you're spending more on mental health than many places are. You're not spending it cleverly, not spending it effectively. That's what I want to achieve. Um, and, and I think this is a really important issue, Norman. It's been described to me by colleagues from abroad that in England uh, the impression is one has a choice. One can either go and see a 
clinician and get your physical health dealt with and your mental health ignored or go and get your mental health dealt with and get your physical yeah. health ignored. And we know that people with mental health problems die many years earlier than other people, which is in itself totally unacceptable. Uh, we know that when someone rings a crisis helpline in this country, I had a letter from a, uh, a constituent of an MP down in the southwest who'd rung the crisis helpline and they hadn't got any reply. Just imagine that. If we had that with 999, no answer to the phone. We have to have equivalent <coughs> services for people facing a crisis in mental health as we have in physical health. Thank you. The last question. Question there in the front. Terry. Terry Silverstone, Kingston Richmond Local Pharmacy Committee. Thank you, Charles, for giving me this opportunity to speak to the Minister. Minister, in London alone we have 1,800 community pharmacies. Integrated care is key to the way forward, as you've elaborated. Community pharmacy definitely want to be part of it. How can we ensure that community pharmacy does become part of it and step up to the mark as it wants to? <coughs> well, I totally agree, first of all. I mean, uh, community pharmacists have a standing in their community. They, they're trusted um, and, and they have ready access. It's, uh, people find it easy uh, and not threatening and not embarrassing to wander into their local pharmacy. And it, it's an essential part of the uh, network of uh, facilities that should be part of uh, a much more integrated system. And I think, in a way, it, it's up to you to make your voice heard in your local area to ensure that you're engaging with the Health and Wellbeing Board, with the other uh, clinical leaders, to ensure that you get a voice at the table and, you know, demonstrate what you can offer, what you can bring to the table to improve care for people in that local area. Uh, in a way, again, you know, I come back to what I said earlier, we can't sort of impose things from Whitehall, but I really encourage you to have that <coughs> um, discussion, that d debate locally to ensure that what you can offer is understood fully and you're not excluded. Thank you, and thank you for your intervention, Minister. Um, we hope to see you here very soon again. And um, can I ask you to join me to thank uh, Norman Lamb for his speech this morning. Thank you. Can I now ask uh, Beverly Bryan to come to the stand? Uh, Beverly is um, the Director of Strategic Systems and Technology for NHS England. And she's joined by uh, Masood Nazir, who's a GP lead uh, for NHS England. So over to you. You have 10 minutes. We do. I just need, um, here we go. I just need the buzzer. There. Good morning, everyone. My name's Beverly Bryant, um, and this is Masood. Um, we're here to launch the new NHS e-referral service, which will be the replacement for Choose and Book. Okay? Basically, moving to electronic referrals is a key component of NHS England's strategy towards paperless. I think it's really important to be clear that when we talk about paperless NHS, this isn't about stopping patients from having paper. In fact, if a, if a patient wants to receive a, a referral letter by paper, then it's perfectly acceptable that they do that. But actually, in this day and age, many also want to receive emails and texts. And what we really want to do now is to upgrade and update the current electronic method um, of, of Choose and Book to, to allow uh, patients to do that. But actually, it needs to work for clinicians as well. It needs to work for GPs, and it needs to work for, for um, hospitals receiving those appointments. So we're going to build on it. We're not going to throw out Choose and Book. The fact is 50% of England use Choose and Book, um, but there's a lot of problems with it. What Masood and I are going to talk about today is how we're going to listen to you, consult with NHS over the next five months to make sure that when we move Choose and Book to the next stage, it works for you. Because if it doesn't work for GPs and it doesn't work for hospitals, it's not going to work for patients. The 50% position we have at the moment is worse than everybody being on paper. 
We've managed to create a perfect storm where hospitals are receiving referrals on a mixed economy. But equally, GPs are struggling to, to uh, be happy with it because of the fact that they, the hospital's slots are not always available. Rather than Masood and I champion it and go on, we've made a short video which I just want to show you now. We all know that digital is faster, safer, more secure. It's part of everyday life. Take booking a flight, for example. Would you visit travel agents or phone around several airlines? Or would you log on to a website that gave you all the information you wanted in a single place? Why should healthcare be any different? Each year, the NHS processes around 17 million referrals. Right now, around half of those are paper. Processing paper referrals is outdated, time-consuming, labour-intensive, costly and can be risky. The average paper referral can add two weeks to a patient's referral to treatment pathway. So, how do we wrestle the paper from the people? By giving them what they want. The current Choose and Book service has been around now for many years and it's been used really well in some places, but not so well in others. Over 40 million referrals have gone through Choose and Book in this time and there are over 47,000 services set up around the country. Undeniably, there are positives we can build on for the future. We have spoken to patients and professional users and have identified a number of areas for improvement. Our GP colleagues told us they need a service that incorporates clinical referral templates and decision aids and provides an enhanced advice and guidance facility. A service that enables them to book their patients into diagnostic services, provides outcome and discharge information and which integrates seamlessly with their clinical system. All services and appointments always available. Overall, a service which is more intuitive and user-friendly. Our consultant colleagues and their teams told us they need a service that shares information and integrates better with their hospital clinical systems, that gives them the ability to link appointments within a pathway and make onward referrals to other colleagues and clinics. A service that improves the referral review process so that they can add electronic notes and instructions for their teams. Our Commissioner colleagues tell us they need better information and reporting capability to monitor patient pathways and outcomes in order to support future commissioning decisions. They also want support for more effective and consistent referral management. And let's not forget what this is all about. Patients. They tell us they would like a state-of-the-art online service with useful information to help them make decisions about their care to be able to book all appointments within their care pathway, including follow-ups and self-referrals, and to be able to use a variety of communication methods such as phone apps, alerts and reminders. So, taking the best of what we have so far, and having listened to our stakeholders, what would we have? Improved access to services, support and choice along the whole pathway. A service that is easier for patients to interact with. Real information to support commissioners. A better quality and safer service. And ultimately, improved health outcomes for patients. This is the vision so far. But we don't want to build a service for you. We want to build a service with you so that we get it right this time and that's why we want to work with you to find out what really matters give us your views help us to build a system that meets the needs of all service users find out more by contacting us via our mailbox or take a look at our website
So, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak here. I think what, what the video shows for me, having been involved um, in looking at commissioning for the last couple of years, is there's a person going around and talking to all the individuals involved. Now, actually, where we've seen successful use of Chosen Book, there's been a successful dialogue with the clinicians, both involved in primary care and secondary care, and all the service providers. And, and that's where the system works. But where it doesn't work is where one group is particularly contracting, commissioning the meetings, and the other group is trying to, trying to make the system, uh, trying to book the appointments. Uh, some organisations who've actually realised what the benefits are have actually made certain that all the meetings that involve any service redesign or any referral process involve all the stakeholders, and actually it works really well. Uh, others, where there hasn't been the resource or the opportunity to do that, haven't succeeded as well, but actually then don't know where to turn to to make, it, make things better. But it remains a, a really good foundation to build upon. I, I work in a practice with 16 partners, and they hold me to account about choosing a book on a regular basis. But even more than them are our secretarial staff, who actually have to process this. Some, some of my clinic, clinician colleagues don't use the system well. The secretaries pick up the pieces. But even without listening to them and how the system works or doesn't work for them, we can't improve it. Shall I go? OK, so how are we going to deliver this? Today is all about the launch. It's to begin the listening exercise. One of the good things about the past few years has been that the team waiting to, with all the pause through the reforms, have been consulting, they've been discussing with GPs, with CCGs, exactly what's wrong, what they don't like about the current choosing book um, system. So we need to hear from you over the next few months. I won't get into too much of the technical um, intricacies of what we're going to do, but the, the engine, the back-end engine that's hold 40, has had 40 million referrals is quite unique. And we're busy replatforming that, moving it from the current technology and upgrading it to make it more flexible and easier to, to um, upgrade and, and use for the future. Whilst we discuss with you what the front end needs to look like. So ideas that me and the team have been discussing are around um, the online travel booking type um, innovations where you have multiple front ends that fit in with GP practice software that's already available that makes it easy and intuitive for them to make those referrals. And equally, but we need you to work with your hospital. We need CCGs to work as a health economy to help make sure that those slots are available. Um, please try and use Choose and Book now. Don't wait for the new technology to be available. We, we think it's going to be about a year before the brand new Choose and Book, uh, the new NHS referral service rather, is ready but if you start to work with it now, that transition will be much, much easier. Back to Masood. I, I think the key thing to understand here are, are the challenges. And actually, with Choosing Book, there's, there's an element of communication with the patients. And not all the patients are aware of how Choosing Book works. And actually, sometimes that letter we gave them didn't include enough information. So I think there's a key challenge here about empowering our patients about what the benefits of Choosing Book are and what rights it gives them and what opportunities it, it gives them as well. Then we look at our referrers. And actually in the past, one of the, most big, the biggest frustrations was not finding the right services and if you did use the system, not being able to find an appointment and then having to revert back to a paper process or a phone call process. So it didn't actually add any benefit to um, the, whole, the whole process at all. Um, and if you want to become paperless, and actually you can't have two systems working. And I think, as Beverly alluded to earlier, the fact we had two dual systems meant, meant it was very difficult for hospitals to manage the system, but also in primary care, where actually you weren't certain which, which, which one to go to. So you always went for the easier one or the one you knew best. Our providers, well actually, they struggled as well. If you speak to some of our consultant colleagues, you know, they'd blame Choose and Book for overbooking their clinics, but actually it wasn't Choose and Book that overbooked their clinics, it was a process. And actually by listening to them and actually looking at actually how we want to mould the service to go forward, for example, advice and guidance. Our consultant colleagues need protected time to make it work more effectively. But if that isn't built into the process, how, how can they move forward? And again, we've got to support our provider colleagues in giving them the opportunity to make the business change uh, to paperless. So less manual referrals coming in allows them more time to, to adopt paperless. And commissioners, actually the, the bigger challenge I think in, in commissioning at the moment is we've asked all our, uh, all CCGs have asked their memberships to look at their referrals. 
but actually getting good information about your referrals is not very easy at all. If you use Choose and Book, actually effectively, you can actually get some intelligent information about what you're doing, your activity, and it makes it, from, instead of being a manual process, a, a fairly easy process to look at what your referrals are like and, and what the outcomes have been, and actually that's much better to, for commissioning and practice to change their behaviour than having to do everything manually. I, I think the key thing here for me is, you know, I, I'm here possibly as an enthusiast, but actually the key thing to make this work and the whole system work is people have to participate. The system hasn't worked, it has worked to a point, but hasn't worked completely. And the intelligence is out there with, with all of you. And I think the critical thing for us is this is only a few examples of where things haven't worked. There's a lot more out there, but there's a lot of examples of where things do work, and we really want to build upon them. So we're really keen, that actually, as part of today, that you come along to the stand, but actually sign up. There's a letter that's gone up from, out from Beverly at the end of May to all area, area teams, encouraging them to get their CCGs and be able to, to come, al come along and, and participate in the workshops, which are going to run until the end of September. And it's critical that you do come along because it's your opportunity now to influence and make sure that you have a system that you feel is fit for purpose. Thank you. Okay, I think we've got a press conference. Um. Thank you. Um, and, um, before we um, um, stop for coffee, which we will stop now, there's a press conference here which is going to be held regarding, um, uh, regarding the new electronic system. Thank you for your attention this morning. Have a good conference.